Hello, welcome to the Carping Gnome again for part two of Winter Carp Fishing. This is called The Gale Force Common, a version of which was published in Waterlog. Grey waves cross the surface of the pool as the winter gale shakes the bare trees of Herefordshire. If a poplar can bend in such a storm, how can a peacock quill waggler hold its own there in the margins, where a froth of dead brambles hang above a baited trench. It's a fine spot, for the water gradually deepens from two and a half feet to five feet or so, and the hollow has yielded me some decent fish on occasions. It is madness to float fish, surely, but the swan shot is doing well, anchoring the quill in the relentless lapping ripples and I've even caught one carp, a small but beautifully formed mirror of two pounds or so. It is modest compensation for being out on a day like this, but the capture gives me hope of better things, as the stark black poplars rattle with every blast. They are rooted at the very edge of Clay Farm Pond, immediately to my right. And I fear for my safety. After all, trees can come down in such boisterous weather. The netting of the small mirror makes me reflect on my purpose. What am I hoping to catch, to achieve? A week before, while float fishing corn in pleasant sunshine, my quill had slid away and I found myself attached to a huge carp, a fish I never glimpsed. Neither my old cane rod nor my angling skills had been up to the task at hand. Never before had I witnessed a rod going straight, and I panicked and applied too much side strain too quickly, causing the hook to pull out. Now I am back with a steelier rod of carbon, my AKN116, and with serious intentions. Every gust seems to bring in fresh considerations. What in fact is a large carp to me? Not so many doubles have been chalked up to my credit. On a day like that, a ten pounder would have been most welcome. More than welcome, in fact. Excited voices come in fits and starts. Drat! Other anglers have arrived, two of them. But they choose to fish the opposite bank, leaving me in peace with my thoughts. Yes, in the 50s a 10 pounder would, would qualify an angler for the Carp Catchers Club. How times have changed. Half a century ago no carp fisher would be out at this time of year in challenging weather. They missed a great deal those early pioneers who only dreamed of summer and golden autumns. For isn't there a certain purity in winter fishing when the skies are vast and troubled and browns and greys are the dominant tones. And one sees the trees for what they always have been, beneath the leaves and bluster. Perhaps a fox will slink through the sleeping orchard on that far slope. Perhaps a flurry of rooks will blow in from the restless wood before me, a cawing, swirling, dramatic performance. Was that a bite? The quill seemed to dip just then. Has something taken a fancy to the soft pellets? It's hard to tell in these conditions. Perhaps the wind is buffeting the float, driving it down. But no, there is no mistake. The quill has gone. I do not strike immediately. I seem to stare and stare after the miracle. It seems unlikely. So incredible. But I have struck. The rod's taken on a battle curve. It's a fine rod with plenty of play at the top and reserve strength further down. I know I can rely on it. Although the pressure is astonishing while the clutch of the Cardinal 66 screams and screams louder than the energetic gale. Haven't great carp been captured on windy days? I think of old Albert Buckley at Mapley and how his impressive fish, including a record breaker, were landed in the teeth of stormy weather. My carp is no record breaker, I'm certain, although I've yet to see it. In fact, the float hasn't broken surface yet because the fish insists on fighting deep. I recall seven barbel, and one day in particular when the river was in spate and I hooked fish after fish by a sunken tree. I could not yield one inch of line as the barbel hammered away, 
towards the welcoming branches which are so far down in noisy bubbling force. I can afford to give a little line here, although there are some snags at the bottom of the pool. I'm backwinding now, having tightened the clutch. I'm more in control as the white fluorocarbon line judders into the surface like an automatic needle over ruffled dirty canvas up and down, up and down. Will this fish never give up? There's an ancient sunken post out there by the island and the carp is aware of it, changing its mode from barbel to pike in a moment. Where did it locate this turn of speed, explosive energy? My fingers can barely hang on to the revolving reel handle. I have to stop this fish, but how? The side strain starts to tell. Thank goodness the line is needling tattoos to the choppy surface as the, as the fish circles and twists just inches from the post. I'm pumping it back now, aware that my arms are getting heavy. Is the fish tired? It must be, as it turns ever decreasing orbits above the grey depths before me. The red tip of the float breaks the surface and suddenly the head of the fish clears the waves, a pair of white lips as round as a golf ball. The battle has lasted 20 minutes or more, but now it's over. As one in trance, like someone in a haunting dream, I push the net out and draw my prize over the floating mesh. It is a common carp, impressive for its length and dark golden flanks. In other pools, a carp of such a length might go more than 12 pounds in weight, but my fish is built for speed and has what BB once called a rakish appearance. I think of the wildest of chess hunt, the great English commons that bent the rods of Sheringham and Andrews almost a full century ago. I don't think my fish is a wildy, although there is something ancient about its lines. I know that Clay Farm Pond, a former syndicate water, was stocked with carp from various states in, in the 70s and early 80s. It is impossible to guess where and how those lines arose. The pond's carp keep the secret of their origins. I want a photograph, but I've left my tripod at home. The carp has been unhooked on the mat, but it's still in the net. And so I place the big net in the lapping shallows and seek assistance from my two fellow anglers on the far bank. They scowl when they hear I have landed two carp, and they scowl in unison when I inform them that one is a double. They even refuse my offer of soft pellets. But one of them agrees to take a quick picture of me with a fish, and for that I will be grateful. I can ask nothing more of the pool, and I tackle down. I've been chilled to the bone by the rude winter winds, but I am content and ready for the long walk back over the fields. After all, I have the vision of a gale force common to keep me company all the way home to a celebratory glass of port by the fireside.